Thank you very much, Tony. Uh, first of all, is uh, the microphone okay? So I'm quite happy to speak with Ada. Is that okay? It's not booming or anything? Good, you're nodding from the back, so that's uh, good. Can I thank Tony and uh, the, um, the, the Progress Association here in Jellybrand and Warren? Um, obviously, because of uh, Joseph Ty's Jellybrand, I chose to uh, have the inaugural lecture in Jellybrand because um, basically he gave his name to this town, although probably if you asked him about it, uh, he didn't actually decide that he wanted it to be this way. And we'll get to that later. Um, what I'd, uh, um, you know, first of all, obviously, really a welcome to you all coming here. And uh, uh, the thanks uh, goes to the uh, people that uh, Tony's mentioned. I will correct him on one thing. Um, I'm not the process uh, at the moment doing my PhD. That may be an option, and there has been some inquiry as to whether um, I'd like to research Joseph Tice and uh, convert it to a PhD. However, um, where I'd like to really start is um, just telling you some of my background and my interest in Joseph Tice jelly brand. Uh, where I am in Bambara, every time I go to school at Colac High School, uh, out to my right hand side of the road is Mount Jelly Brand, which I'm, also, I'm sure you're all familiar with, just north, north of the highway. Uh, close to Biragara. So it's been like a, a finger pointing at me for 17 years, uh, referring me to the mystery, the questions associated with uh, the explorer, and uh, it's just like a constant uh, presence there for me. And uh, sometimes when I spend uh, six months or so not really thinking too much about it, it's there in my face the whole time. So it's just like some reminder to me. Uh, when we look at uh, Joseph Tice Jellybrand and we look at the many references that are around to the man, there are streets named after him, rivers, mountains, settlements, electorates, Jellybrand electorate in Melbourne, Point Jellybrand, there was originally a Port Jellybrand as well. So I found about 25 place name references to Joseph Tice Jellybrand. And talking to people and so on, there are some people that uh, have got no idea about uh, Jelly Brand through to people that are quite knowledgeable about, about the man. But most of what I find in Victoria is that um, most people, uh, if they do know anything about Jelly Brand, is um, they come to his disappearance. And that's the thing that um, seems to grab people, grab people's attention as to who he was and the fact that he disappeared somewhere in the Western District. Um, I'd like to also uh, just draw your attention to uh, Bob Bat, who has basically also inspired me to uh, go into much more research on Joseph Tice. He's a man from Forest, and in um, 1987, uh, he basically contacted me when he knew I was interested in Joseph Tice and uh, gave me a lot of information on him. So I'd just like to attribute a lot of what I know to Bob Bat. He can't be with us um, here tonight. And uh, our connection is we were both born in Devon. Uh, so we, the sons of Devon are here. And uh, we've taken an interest in an Englishman and how he disappeared in Australia. So we've done a lot of research and detective work. Also, you probably would notice that um, in uh, Geelong, there is uh, the Buckley, or has been the Buckley exhibition with William Buckley. And one thing that inspires me too is that there is now this uh, interest in the 1840s or the early 1800s in our history in Victoria and generally in Australia. And um, there is a fascination with Buckley. Now, I've spoken to the curator of that exhibition and uh, said basically, well, uh, Jelly Brown employed Buckley as an interpreter and, and a protector of Aborigines in the Western District. I find it uh, strange that there's no mention there in your exhibition. But he's, he acknowledges uh, uh, what uh, uh, Joseph Tice Jelly Brown has done, but he said, well, I'm concentrating on Buckley, and uh, it's up to you to concentrate on Joseph Tice Jelly Brown. Now, what I'd like to do is um, perhaps take about an hour of your time. If I see anybody nodding off, I'll immediately move to questions. Uh, so uh, there it is, the first um, eyelid I see uh, rolling or whatever, and then I'll bring it to a close. I'll skip a couple of pages. But what I really want to do is uh, to tell you a little bit about who Joseph Tice Jellybrand was, spend about half of the, an hour telling you a little bit about him, 
and then to move to uh, our theory on where and why he disappeared um, in the Otways. Now, basically, uh, Joseph Tice Jellybrand, his actual birth is a mystery. So right at the start, we have a mystery. The, um, the Australian uh, Dictionary of Biography puts his uh, date of birth at 1786. Uh, the family tell me this is incorrect. He was in fact born in 1792. But the research, even the family research, shows that he doesn't have a birth certificate. He was either born in Brentford in London or Edmonton in Surrey. But there is no birth certificate, and this may be because his family were known as dissenters. They were a Christian family, but they were non-conformists. So there are two theories. Either um, he uh, was born at one of those two places and the birth certificate disappeared, or uh, they chose not to have him baptized because of their religious beliefs, and no birth certificate was ever issued. So straight away we get a mystery right at the start of the man. Um, anyway, he was uh, called to the bar at, at the age of 24 as a lawyer in 1816, and he had a flourishing practice in London. Uh, he had a bit of a weak chest. He wasn't a very robust uh, man, in, earlier in his life anyway. And uh, Lord Bathurst, who was the Secretary of State for the Colonies in Britain, uh, basically offered him the Attorney Generalship of Tasmania and thought it would be a good idea, one, for, uh, to uh, extend his career and also it would have been a better climate for him. So he um, basically took on the uh, role of Attorney General. He decided he was going to take it on. So he was offered it in 1822 and he, with his father William, his wife Anne Isabella and three children, migrated to Tasmania, to Hobart, in 1823. He took on the uh, role of uh, Attorney General of Tasmania in 1824, and he also had a very flourishing private practice as a barrister in Hobart. But he had a problem, and that was Governor Arthur, which I imagine a few of you would know, but anyway, he was the Governor of Tasmania, and he's given his name to the uh, Port Arthur which has become rather famous uh, uh, just uh, recently. Um, now, Port, um, Arthur himself was, uh, oh, forget that. Arthur himself uh, was, shall we say, a bit of a conservative. For those people who have got any knowledge of the politics of the time, there were Whigs and Tories, and uh, uh, um, Arthur was a Tory, and he immediately took a dislike to Joseph Tice Jellybrand, who was his Attorney General. And uh, Jellybrand also didn't like the way that uh, uh, Governor Arthur was conducting his business in Tasmania, and he combined with uh, the local newspaper editor of the um, Hobart Town Gazette, a person called Robert Murray, and together they formed uh, a relationship. Uh, they were basically attracted to each other because of their intellectual pursuits, and also the dislike of Governor Arthur. Well, at that time, to criticise the local governor was not a good idea. So Arthur really sort of set about uh, an, a scheme to dismiss Jellybrand, and it came along when uh, Jellybrand was accused of representing both sides of the argument uh, in his practice as a barrister and also in his practice um, as a Crown uh, barrister. So a hearing commenced, conducted by uh, Justice Pedder, Gave, gives his name to Lake Pedder, and um, the uh, Solicitor General, Stephen at the time, brought a case against uh, Joseph Tice Jellybrand, uh, basically on um, the grounds of misconduct. Uh, all my research points to the fact that it was really a setup, that what he was accused of was common practice in, in England, and uh, really it wasn't a, a legal problem at all. But some of the uh, the court proceedings are quite uh, funny in the way that um, the miniature on the top right hand corner there of Joseph Tice, there are only three images that I've found of Joseph Tice, and uh, it's said that he had a satirical smile. Now if you look at the miniature there, and uh, my wife looked at it, and she said, yeah, that's a satirical smile. Now, I'm not quite sure whether it is or it isn't, but in this court case, he said that he entered the court case, which was going to be a long one, and he had a satirical smile on his face. Um, so, whatever. But 
uh, after a day's proceedings and uh, uh, Magistrate uh, Pedder was giving him a hard time and uh, he uh, was obviously uh, being set up. So Jelly Brown at the end of the day said, gentlemen, I wish you good morning. When you treat me as a gentleman, I will attend you, but not before. And with that, he walked out of the court and he walked into history because shortly after that, uh, Arthur seized on the opportunity and said, right, I'll have him dismissed. So as a result of that, uh, Joseph Tice Jellyram was dismissed as Governor General of Tasmania by Arthur. Um, now, just at that time in, uh, in 1826, it was, a, it was a small colony and it was a convict colony and basically the social scene in, uh, in Tasmania was uh, around the, uh, the Arthur government officials and the court. So I find it really difficult to imagine how um, a, a person like Joseph Tice Jellybrand, who was uh, an English aristocrat and a lawyer, uh, was involved in the Hobart, which would have had a few thousand population, him and Arthur would have been running across each other all the time. And yet they were, if you like, almost like sworn enemies. But I think Arthur hated uh, Joseph Tice more than the other way around. Anyway, things like Arthur, after about a year, attempted a reconciliation with, uh, with Jelly Brown. And at uh, St. David's Church in Hobart, he went to Joseph Tice's pew, because obviously they had pews all their own, little stamps on the end, you know, at that time. And uh, he opened the Bible and he handed it to Joseph Tice. And there are two stories. One is that um, they were about to take communion. And uh, uh, Arthur referred him to a chapter in the Bible which uh, showed that um, you should not be at uh, anyone's throats or be anyone's enemy before you take communion. So the story is that he handed him the Bible. And uh, one is that uh, Joseph Tice shook hands with him and they made up. The other one that I'm uh, more inclined to believe is that Jay Brown read the Bible passage, passed it back to Governor Arthur and got up and walked out of the church. Anyway, uh, following that, for the next uh, about 10 years, Jay Brown and his father built up incredibly big pastoral enterprises and they bought, they bought more properties in uh, Tasmania, thousands of acres, and Jay Brown's law practice flourished to the extent where three quarters of the colonists' work, law work, in Tasmania came through Joseph Tice's office. So he must have been really big time. He uh, was obviously a very rich man and he was building up his pastoral uh, interests as well as this thriving law practice as a barrister. But all the time he attempted to clear, clear his name. He was very upset with the way he'd been treated by Arthur and he wrote uh, many letters through Arthur to uh, the government in England and many of them did not get there. Arthur was obviously not even sending his mail but he also sent private letters to um, England to try and get redress for the position he was in. Lord Bathurst basically replied to Arthur and agreed that um, Arthur had moved against Jelly Brown incorrectly and he advised uh, Arthur to reinstate uh, Joseph Tice, but because it took six months for um, post to get from England to Tasmania at that time, that letter arrived and uh, Bathurst had lost his position in England after an election and somebody else came in. So Arthur seized on that chance uh, to never ever have to wrestle with the problem of whether to appoint Jelly Brand again. Also at the time, to show that uh, the government in England were on the side of Jelly Brown. He was offered a position as the Governor General of the Cape of Good Hope and also the um, Isle of France, which is in fact Mauritius. So he had two offers of Governor Generalships in those two places. And also he was, um, he was encouraged to apply for the Attorney Generalship of New South Wales. But um, again, Arthur sent letters to the um, Governor of Darling at that time, suggesting that he should not do that. So in the, I suppose, the, the mood of the time, um, it would have been a bit, of a, a bit outrageous for Governor Darling to appoint a, a man with uh, a pass. Um, at this time, just, you know, at the end of this um, period of 10 years after he was um, dismissed, 
the colonists at the time in uh, Tasmania put together a really large dinner and reception for Gellibrand, basically to show their support for him and their dislike of Arthur. And Gellibrand, again, I find him just an interesting character. And what did he do? He didn't turn up. What he did do is he sent a, um, a letter explaining his position and basically he was saying, look, I do think I've been treated incorrectly, but I'm not going to put myself in a, in a position where I'm seen to be undermining uh, the governor of the state. So that was an interesting reflection on his personality. In 1834 and 35, uh, Jellybrand was the instrumental in putting together the Port Phillip Association. What he noted was that the pastures and so on in, um, in Tasmania were inadequate for the pastoralists that were then there. And Tasmania was a thriving community and New South Wales was basically based on Sydney and uh, there was really hardly any, any white settlement in Victoria whatsoever. So uh, Jelly Brown, his family and so on had tried some other ventures in uh, the Swan River near uh, Perth and that was a failure. So coming back from there they decided that uh, the only place to expand was in Victoria. Now he'd been acquainted with um, Batman, which I'm sure you all know, uh, John Batman, credited with the founding of Melbourne. He was acquainted with him from um, 1825 and both of them had uh, developed pastoral interests and uh, they had their eyes on the mainland since then. Jellybrand and uh, Batman sent a letter to Governor Darling in 1827 and basically said to Darling, look, we're willing to provide 5,000 pounds worth of stock that we're willing to send across the Bass Strait uh, to uh, the area of Port Phillip and we want uh, your imprimatur to uh, basically grant us um, land on which we can stock, give us title to the land. And there was a scheme there at that time where uh, if you provided capital uh, to a particular area of land, then you could have the uh, area of land equivalent to that capital. And that was worked out by uh, the uh, governors at the time. Um, Jelly Brown is uh, also uh, right down in there in history as a person that drafted the Dudigala Treaty which uh, basically was signed by a group of Aboriginals, the tribes of um, the area of Port Phillip. It was based on a treaty that Jelly Brown knew about that was um, formed by a person called Penn, whose name was given to Pennsylvania, and his treaty was uh, the one that, where the Native Americans signed over their land for uh, you know the traditional beads and trinkets and all that sort of stuff, and Jellybrand wrote up the Dudigala Treaty in much the same way. But the basic difference was, and this is where I think Jellybrand is different from uh, a lot of the others, if we might say, dispossessors at the time, the white uh, uh, people of aristocratic background, convicts, uh, emancipists, and so on, the back the basic land grab. Because in this treaty, uh, it basically bound the white people, the white men at the time, to a yearly payment of rent or tribute to the tribes. Now, that in itself, if you read the treaty, is pretty unbelievable at the time because it basically granted land rights to the Aboriginals. So if that treaty had ever been operable, then uh, the sort of problems that we have today might be totally different to what they are. Uh, now, Jelly Brown basically, in my reading, uh, they often refer to him as an idealist, a man of affairs. He wanted the colony in uh, Victoria, soon to become Victoria, to be people under a scheme of encouragement <coughs> with free settlers and not an extension of a penal settlement. Uh, now, if I read just a, a quote from him, it's in pretty small type, so. I'm sure that with my research on Jelly Brown, my eyes are probably going to go worse and worse as time goes on. But if I can just read you, it says, um, not, not Arthur, but Joseph Tice Jelly Brown was the leading spirit of the Port Phillip scheme. The association was formed by the foremost figures in the free society of Van Diemen's land, distinguished by the financial skill of Swanston and the technical efficiency of Wedge, but inspired by Jelly Brown. 
with the idea of fair treatment of the, of the native people and sound management of the new territory. Bonwick, and he was an historian at the time, pays tribute. Um, honest in his profession and Christian in his deportment, he was one of those who had a chivalrous attachment to the uh, coloured race, recognising the rights of the Aborigines to the soil and indignant at the way these rights were disregarded by British settlers and officials. Having witnessed the horrors of the Black Wars in Van Diemen's Land, he determined in the face of God and man to make the interests of the natives of Port Phillip his special care in any negotiation for settlement over there. He it was who drew up the treaty, so much derided by those whose sense of the ridiculous is stronger than their sense of justice. And that's a quote from uh, Roy Bridges, who um, is an historian who wrote uh, a book which I have here, which um, I'd like you to have a look at if you wish. Okay, so uh, the treaty was signed in 1835, and that's part of where Batten's famous uh, statement of um, this is a place for a village. Uh, another interesting point there is that um, if you know anything about the early settlement of Melbourne, Faulkner also claims to be the founder of the uh, city of Melbourne. And it's just even that sort of study in itself, but let me just point you to one thing I find rather, rather funny in that when Batman had had this treaty signed, he returned to Launceston in the north of Tasmania and went to Faulkner's Hotel. He walked in there and he had a few jars that night and uh, he then at one stage is said to have uh, made this statement, I am now the greatest landowner in the world. And he was, a pr he was pretty uh, drunk at the time, so the story goes. And in a sense he was because he had, ha he had in his hand a treaty sign which gave him the title as far as he was concerned to 600,000 acres, basically stretching from uh, Western Port Bay through to the Werribee River. Uh, and uh, Jelly Rain, in fact, had uh, 100,000 of those acres in Lot 12, which extended from Williamstown through to the Werribee River. Anyway, uh, uh, Faulkner is listed as not having a drink that night, uh, whilst Batman got further out of it. And uh, it's thought that basically what he was doing was uh, sitting there waiting for uh, Batten to hang himself so he could further his ambitions in the new colony and could basically uh, jump in the place of Batman and say, I was the founder of, uh, of Melbourne and not uh, Batten. Turner, another uh, uh, historian of the side uh, at the time, also quotes, and as their deed of association showed, the colonising principles which they adopted would have rendered government supervision almost unnecessary. So if the treaty had gone through, there is a view that uh, um, the thing would at least have gone ahead, the settlement of uh, Victoria, in an orderly manner as far as Joseph Tice Jelly Brown and the lawyer was concerned. And it raises the issues of terra nullis and prior ownership and legal title, because you've got to remember that uh, Jelly Brown was a barrister. And so he thought like a barrister. Uh, Jelly Brown had about nine visits that I've uh, found to Port Phillip in the uh, time from uh, the treaty being signed in 1835 to uh, his momentous visit, obviously, in 1837. Um, the most detailed, most detailed excursion he ever made was in January the 17th, 1836, and I've got a memorandum written in Joseph Tyson Jelly Brown's own hand and he brought 1,200 sheep for Captain Swanson, who gave his name to Swanson Street, um, on a journey to uh, Western Port Bay. Um, it was a desperate journey, and uh, there was much foreboding on the trip. There is a um, uh, full report of it. It's a, a long report. I don't want to take you all the way through it. Um, but basically, it tells me a little bit about his bushcraft. Some people think that he was um, not a bushman, and I don't think he was, but uh, he basically landed these sheep uh, at Port Phillip and uh, basically herded these sheep from Port Phillip west around the head of the bay to the then settlement of, um, of uh, Yarra, as it was, before it was called Melbourne. When he arrived there, uh, he describes there being 12 mud huts. So this is in uh, 1836. 
he was incorrect in that because Faulkner already had a hotel there. Um, then, just after that, that particular um, excursion, he also took an excursion into this area, into the, and it's called the Geelong Expedition. And the interesting part um, of this, uh, from my point of view, is that Buckley had given himself up uh, to one of the Batten parties, part of the Port Phillip Association. And uh, after 32 years of living with the Aborigines, the Wutherong tribe mainly, uh, Jellybrand was really excited by this because he saw obviously the chance that he was a man that spoke all the Aboriginal languages in this area at the time. And uh, he immediately met up with Buckley and said, look, I'd like you to work for us as an interpreter and I'll make you the protector of Aborigines in this area. So he built up a, a really good working relationship with Buckley. And uh, there's a book here of um, Buckley's um, life and he does credit uh, Jellybrand with being a good bloke. Um, now they investigated Buckley and uh, Jellybrand, uh, Jellybrand's block, block 12, um, near the Jellybrand River. And Buckley relates in his story about uh, the treatment of uh, Aborigines by Jellybrand. And there are a number of occasions where Jellybrand uh, basically uh, says uh, this treatment of so and so, an Aboriginal, is unjust. And, um, a number of uh, instances where he calls white people to account for their treatment of Aborigines. So Buckley was impressed with this, and Buckley was in a dilemma really. He lived with uh, the Aboriginal tribes for 32 years. He was going back into a white society. He was in the pay now of the Port Phillip Association, 56 pounds a year, which was a lot of money at that stage. So I guess he was in a pretty schizophrenic uh, position of, uh, I've just been living this time with the black. The Port Phillip Association to come and meet him in, in Sydney uh, at an executive council meeting, and uh, Jelly Brown was appointed the delegate of the Port Phillip Association to meet with uh, Governor Burke and the executive council. They had great discussions, and Jelly Brown was saying, Look, um, Melbourne is there, uh, we want to settle um, the district of uh, this area here, he didn't call it Victoria then and we want your imprimatur, we basically want you to grant us a title. And uh, there was toing and froing there, but in my, in my reading of the time, uh, it comes out strongly that the government in, in England were basically saying to Burke, who is this guy? Uh, why, how can he possibly as a private citizen and a private organisation be asking the British Crown for private rights to a part of New South Wales? You know, this is crazy. Uh, and again, it, in the reading, it sort of says, Jelly Brown must have known this. He was a smart lawyer, and he was obviously trying it on. And uh, he probably thought, in the back of his mind, it would never succeed. And you know, that's another story. Um, was he totally convinced he could get away with it, or wasn't he? We, we don't know at this stage. Anyway, um, uh, the uh, quote uh, from Wedge at the time, uh, uh, who was a member of the, um, the Jelly Brand Association and he was really the surveyor. He surveyed out the sites uh, for the um, 15 people that formed the Port Phillip Association at the time. And as a result of uh, the rejection by Burke of the Port Phillip Association's uh, proposal, uh, Wedge writes, uh, wrote disgustedly, the first occupation of Port Phillip by the association, the members of which were resident in Van Diemen's land, was looked upon with jealousy by the stockholders in New South Wales. Had the enterprise originated with themselves, a different construction of Lord Glenelg's liberal instructions would have doubt doubtless been arrived at. So obviously saying that if the Port Phillip Association had come out of New South Wales, there might have been a totally different reaction. Um, so, uh, my quote here from um, uh, Roy Bridges at the time uh, concludes this section with that Jelly Brand and Batman basically called a great colony into life, Victoria. The Jelly Brand was the inspiration through the Port Phillip Association which founded our state and the city of Melbourne. Okay, so that I, I hope uh, fills you in. I'm not doing too bad, there's half an hour. 
um, on who Jelly Brown basically was. Now we move to uh, the fate of Jelly Brown. <coughs> Jelly Brown intended to move to Port Phillip Bay for the summer months. And you know, it sounds a bit like us moving to Queensland, you know, for the summer months. Um, and, uh, you know, because he had, uh, you know, I suppose he had a dodgy chest still and uh, he uh, didn't like the cold weather, and we're much the same again. He was going to live for the summer months in Port Phillip, that was his idea. In February, the, uh, on February the 20th, 1837, he sailed on the brig ship Henry from Launceston with his son, uh, Tom Jellybrand, who was 15 at the time, and Hess, uh, a lawyer who had come to Tasmania uh, four years previously. And also uh, Sinclair and Armitage, I guess some of you know Armitage and uh, you know, the link to Cumberland House and so on. These were the sort of aristocrats at the time, I guess. They were carrying stock for the Clyde Company, uh, sheep, and also for George Russell. And uh, Russell uh, records some of Jelly Brown's uh, conversation um, because he uh, came down to check out his sheep um, on the Brig Jelly, on the Brig um, uh, Henry at uh, Point Henry at the time, and they were um, at anchor there. And Jelly Brown basically said to Russell that he proposed to visit Swanston's property on the Lee River, which was a river that flowed from where present-day the Lee is, uh, south to the Byron River. And he had just um, secured, squatted on a property of a few thousand acres on the banks of the Lee River. So, Jelly Brown uh, was filling in the time. Uh, actually, at that time, he was due to meet Governor Burke in, um, in Melbourne. And, but Governor Burke was delayed. So Jelly Brown decided to have a bit of a look around the place. So you know, he decided to go and see Swanson's property. Swanson was one of his mates in the Port Phillip Association. And the interesting thing was that um, uh, Jelly Brown pointed out the Yu Yangs as they sailed into um, a, a, a Point Henry. And um, uh, Russell said, there were the Yu Yangs. And, um, Jelly Brown said, no, they're not the Yu-Yangs. You can't see the Yu-Yangs from Carayo Bay. And this is really critical to um, his disappearance. He said, look, the Yu-Yangs, or as they were called then, Station Peak, were named by the uh, navigator Flinders as a guide on their um, southern passage through the Bass Strait. So Jelly Brown knew about them, but the thing that fascinates me is that uh, you can see the Yu-Yangs from Point Henry, and how come he was thinking that they were not the Yu Yangs, especially as earlier in his career he had actually walked through the Yu Yangs? So there are some answers that I still am wrestling with. Anyway, Chip Hess was from London and he arrived in 1833 and he was a successful lawyer and he had uh, represented a number of um, cases in the Supreme Court. He was a tall, thin uh, man, said to be of little strength. I don't have any image of, um, of uh, uh, Hess at all, we're still looking for it. Anyway, they decided what they were going to do is to ride to Cardinia Station, which was a property of Dr. Alex Thompson, and from there they were to go to Pollock Station, which is now Karawatha, and they stayed the night there, and they hired a shepherd called Ackers, who was Thompson's shepherd, Dr. Thompson's shepherd and he was going to lead them to Swanson's property. So they woke the next morning and they set off on horseback, uh, the three of them, uh, with the intention of uh, going to Swanson's property on the Lee River, then taking uh, direction northeast to the Yu Yangs, and then uh, east to pick up the Yarra River and back to Melbourne in one day. Now that's a bit of a trip. It is possible that uh, Roy Rogers and Trigger and uh, the Lone Ranger and stuff like that, they might have been able to make, make it at a gallop, but uh, these guys going into reasonably unexplored territory, I think, was a, a little bit of an ask. So anyway, that was, their, that was their idea. So they set out for the Lee River and Swanson's property. Now, um, I have a, uh, a dialogue, which was apparently reported by Ackers at the time, um, of the last time that Ackers um, was in conversation with uh, Jelly Brown and Hess, and it says, After travelling along the open plain country on the northern banks of the Berwyn, 
<clears throat> for about 15 miles. A guy who was on foot expressed his unwillingness to proceed any further in the same direction, wanting the ordinary supplies of provision. Observing that there was not an inch of the country occupied between his master's station, beyond his master's station. That's uh, Thompson. At this last objection of the guide, the infatuated barrister was highly amused and pointing to the conical shaped mountain of the Warriors at Lake Karangamite, under the impression that he saw Vilunati or Station Peak Hills. My good fellow, he remarked, behold, look for yourself, yonder is Station Peak right before your very eyes. Now, he was pointing in that direction, and the Yu Yangs were in that direction. So you tell me, what was the story? Anyway, Station Peak, sir, explained that, because no, no, sir, you must excuse me. That mount is at least 50 miles uh, from Station Peak. The tut tut nonsense man quickly retorted the other. Anyone with a grain of common sense ought to know better. I'm sorry to contradict you, sir, replied the guide. Villanati Hills are quite in the opposite direction. Stay, listen, my dear friend, Jody Brown, joined his doubting friend. There is common sense in this. At least, Akers declares that if we only ride to those two little hills on the plain, he will show us not only the very peak in question, but the Bay of Geelong at its base. Think you it would not be the wiser course to adopt in order more certainly to ascertain our true position? No, the the uh, mountains that he was looking at were Jelly Brown and Hess now. No, Hess, most distinctly no, useless labour. Yon hill is Station Peak, yes, and no other. Tis the beacon marked and named by Flinders for mariners to steer by, and it shall be our, our, shall be our good pilot also. Surely a better landmark, no traveller could desire. Pray trust in me, rest assured I've not travelled the bush for so many years and so many hundred miles from nothing. In a word then, if Master Bob Acker's heart does fail him, if he really fears to accompany us further on our route, we'll show him that our instinctive knowledge of localities is very considerably in advance of his. On my word and honour, sir, you're wrong. You are indeed, sir, emphatically rejoined the guide. Pardon me, sir, I think you seem determined to leave your bones in some lone place never to be discovered by a mortal man. Don't go in that direction through an unknown country without a compass, arms or provision. Pray don't, sir, it's certain death to do so. Tut nonsense, my good fellow, talk to the winds, you're certainly demented. I, sh I shall travel the banks of this river yet some few miles and then shape my course for that hill. Cowie and Steve's homestead is assuredly situate on this peak of, on this side of the peak. Really, Jelly Brown resumed his perplexed and nervous companion, this is Hess. I confess I am much alarmed and quite at a loss what line to pursue between the two opinions. But I'm afraid I must find for the defendant Ackers. Now, imagine these two guys, lawyers there, and they're sort of having a court case in the middle of the bush, right? Um, yeah, so uh, since I feel it so strongly impressed on my mind that he is right, we ought at least to return to Pollock Station and lay in the stock of problem before we undertake such doubtful projects. And then the prudent guide says he will accompany us, go where we may. Come, Jerry Brown, you see, the majority is against you. Therefore, I say, yield, surrender. It's only a matter of half a day later, and we shall be amply repaid by the reflection that we have adopted a wise precaution. Hess, my dear and esteemable friend, Hess, have you no confidence whatever in me? Would you also show the white feather? Jesus Christ, doesn't it? Rebel against and desert me in such a moment with this glorious park-like country before your very eyes. Can I believe my own senses emphatically continue the excited barrister. Think you that I value my life at so little price to risk its loss by an act of voluntary and unpardonable folly? You hurt my bushman pride. Hess, you of all others should know me better. Come, carriage, my boy, carriage. Let's face a dreadful bugbear. Then throwing himself into the saddle and breaking a biscuit in half, he addressed the astounded guide in a confident and patronising tone, saying, Ackerge, you're a truant pilot. You've a long walk before you, but since you're determined to go no further, here, you renegade. I divide my last biscuit with you, and thank you also for your good inten intentions and efficient services so far. No, sir, no indeed, I will not take it, replied the man, shaking his head in unfeigned regret. And as he afterwards related to me, Lloyd, scarcely believing the poor gentleman to be in earnest, he added, Never should I forgive myself if I took one single crumb of it. Uh, too soon, I fear, 
you'll feel the want of a biscuit and every other necessary of life. Be very sparing of it, sir. Three or four hours will see me safe at home, whereas persist in taking that route and depend on it. That biscuit will be the last you'll ever break in this world. Ackers replied the brat barrister, you preach so well that I either living to give away, I'll, I, I'll think of the truant guide. Although no power to gain, we remark poor Hess, shrugging his shoulders in doubtful mood, an ominous, an ominous um, presentiment pervades my mind. That tells me if we proceed far into this unknown, unsettled country, the prophetic words of our plain speaking guide will be most sorrowfully verified. Come think again, dear Jelly Brand. Shall we go back, eh? Come, say the word. No, it's no, my very worthy, but I fear white chicken hearted friend, exclaimed Jelly Brand. Return if you will, but advance is the word with me. So now, uh, farewell, Bob Ackers. Then putting spurs to his horse, the doomed, determined man rode off and was immediately, with marked reluctance, followed by his dispirited and doubting companion. Ackers, in a, dumb, a state of dumb astonishment, remained at the place of departure, watching in sorrowful, uh, sorrowful contemplation the receding figures of his gentleman friends until they were lost in the distance, and to the eye of the man as he mentally exclaimed, forever. And then he returned to the station. That's a fairly, uh, you know, it's a, an old style um, a rendition of supposedly the last uh, words that were ever heard by any white man of uh, Jellybrand. Now, um, Jellybrand basically thought at that stage that he was on the Jellybrand River. And Bob Bud and I have been into the area, and uh, it's in a position where the Jellybrand joins the uh, Byron River, and it's basically a swamp. And Ackers basically uh, felt that they had missed the junction of the Jelly Brand and, sorry, missed the junction of the Lee River and the Barham River, whereas Jelly Brand thought that he was on the Lee River. So they basically parted at the present day Winchelsea. And nothing more was heard of them. Now, back at Pollock Station, uh, they were waiting for the return of Jelly Brand. And so by March the 6th, which is about two weeks later, Pollock, Armitage, Lloyd, and Ackers uh, were alarmed and basically decided they were going to go and look for him. So they followed the tracks uh, and followed Ackers to where the last time they had been seen, which was at uh, Winchelsea. And they followed the tracks to the, that position. And then they decided, because uh, Jelly Brown had pointed to the Warrian Hills and said they were the Yugangs, they switched over to the Warriors and searched there for a week and then returned. And no trace. Now, uh, Jelly Brown's son, who was also waiting in the Yarra settlement for um, uh, his father, they got up um, a search party about two uh, weeks later, which included Buckley, who was obviously the best sort of person around to track him. And uh, they also, with Cowie Steve, Stieglitz, Road Knight, went in the same direction. And basically they, instead of going to uh, Lake Colac immediately, um, took the Byron River to Virigara. And Buckley is recorded as uh, having tracked uh, their horses, their hoof prints, to Virigara and then came across some steeply wooded gullies and so on, and thick tea tree, and the tracks were lost. So at that point, they gave up the search and they returned. Two months later, a Dr. Cotter and five men um, followed the same route and came to what they described as the edge of a formidable forest, and they also turned from what is obviously um, the Otway Ranges, and uh, took a course to Lake Colac and uh, commenced the search there. Mrs. Jellyman, obviously, at the time, was uh, obviously mortified by the fact that uh, her father, her um, husband was missing, uh, put up a 300 pound reward and also kitted out a huge search party which was funded to the tune of 700 pounds at the time. It included Naylor, Parsons, Whitten, Cotter, uh, some Bushmen, two native guides, and Batman and Buckley. And they set off uh, with a huge amount of provisions and stuff in search of, uh, of Jellybrand. Now this is the one that is recorded uh, in great um, 
in great detail. And just to take you quickly through them, uh, when they were about to set off, some uh, Aboriginals came to them with the report that two white men had been murdered by the Karakoi tribe near Lake Colac. And they, with this knowledge, headed towards uh, the last camp, which you'll see again. And they were overtaken by the Barrabal tribe, uh, a war party who basically had been friendly with uh, Jodhran, who had in fact been promised trinkets and, uh, and um, tomahawks and various other sort of things that they valued. And uh, they considered themselves, I suppose, being done out of the deal. So they also, in my reading, uh, were not friends of the Karakoi tribe. So they were out, if you like, as a war party or a revenge party. So they took off and they passed this huge party of white, white guys and uh, some Aboriginal guides, um, and they were hot-footing it to uh, get to the uh, Karakoi tribe themselves. They arrived at the Karakoi camp, that is the, um, the search party, which I believe was probably, by the way, to describe it, about where Balnagaman is now, and uh, found the Karakoi camp. The, uh, a, an elder of that tribe called Tanapia was captured by the, um, the Barrable Blacks and a confession apparently was forced out of him that um, he and uh, his tribe's people had uh, speared Jelly Brown and Hess, had stripped them of their, of their uh, clothes and thrown them into Lake Colac and then their horses had bolted with um, spears hanging out of their sides. They, uh, that's Tanapai and his daughter, were immediately killed by the blacks and the uh, party stood back in horror at what was going on and they uh, decided at that stage that uh, that, was, that was enough, that was the end of the story, uh, open and shut case. So they returned to Melbourne and that basically became at that time the end of the story. Now Hugh Murray who settled uh, Colac in April, just three months after the disappearance of Jelly Brown and Hess, corroborates that same story. Now, um, the fifth search party, the one I can find, five search parties, so you can see how important it was that they figured uh, that they find him, was set out in 1838 in June. And Smythe, a, a surveyor at the time, he comes in the story a bit later, Clark, a native Jack and so on, went to the Lake Colac area and again searched uh, um, uh, in great detail around the area of Lake Colac. So that was the last search party, and I guess for the time, uh, that was the story as it was to that time. And meantime, the insurance company that insured Jay Rand's life for 10,000 pounds, they were reluctant to, to pay out without a body. But after 18 months uh, from the disappearance of Jelly Brand, they paid out the sum of 10,000 pounds, which in today's terms would have been about a million dollars. Now that's pretty relevant to the case, and that's another story again another time perhaps. But in um, 1987, Bob Budd I've told you about, uh, knew I was doing some research on Jelly Brown, and he contacted me with a map. And on this map, Wilkinson's geological map of 1865, there clearly on the map, uh, on the lower Jelly Brown River, was the grave site of Joseph Tice Jelly Brown, there marked on the map. So immediately I was uh, you know, pretty excited about that, as you can imagine, and Bob Butt said to me, well, doesn't it seem strange that we have, we're standing in Jelly Brand right here? Now, uh, we have Jelly Brand, we have Upper Jelly Brand, we have Lower Jelly Brand, we have the Jelly Brand River, we have Point Hess uh, on the coast between Moonlight Head and uh, Warrnambool, and now we have Jelly Brand's grave. Why is it that after all this time, after 164 years of people still talking about him disappearing on the shores of Lake Colac, how come this place you're sitting in has got bears his name? Uh, surely there's got to be a story to this. And that's, I guess, what led us to the pursuit of the Henry Allen story. Now, Henry Allen is uh, our, our theory. And uh, Henry Allen's um, story uh, is uh, what I wish to have a quick read to you. Is anybody going to sleep yet? Can you see anybody going to sleep? No? Good. If there is, just call me out. No. What's that? Glass of water? Oh, yeah, that's okay. Yeah, I probably press the first time a bit harder, but um, water will do for a moment. Um, now, this is from the Colonial Times of uh, 
uh, Wednesday, July the 10th, 1844. Okay, now that's uh, seven years after Jay Graham disappeared. The insurance money had already been paid out, and that's really important. And the money, obviously, of 300 pounds, uh, it was uh, put up um, as a reward, had been there and nobody claimed it, although many people had tried. Anyway, um, it will be in the recollect recollection of many of our readers that about six years ago, these gentlemen started for Port Phillip together uh, with um, uh, in search of a cattle run. Henry Allen, a settler on the Hopkins, detailed to the Mill Bolden, our informant, the following interesting particulars relative to the fate of uh, the uh, missing and much lamented wanderers. Mr. Allen states, having repeatedly heard it asserted by the natives in his, uh, in his immediate vicinity, that if he would accompany them 40 miles eastward along the coast near Moonlight Head, they would uh, show him the remains of a white man who had been six years ago killed by the natives. The murdered man they described as having um, been of the middle age, middle size, light hair, and very little of it, like, like that. Uh, short, thick red whiskers, one of his front teeth uh, cut short off, uh, as it were, at the gun, dressed when taken by the blacks in leather strap breeches with a wide leather belt round his waist and a brace of pistols and a watch in his pocket. Um, this uh, description corresponds um, exactly with the dress and general appearance of the late uh, Mr. Jellybrand. Mr. Allen proceeded to the spot pointed out and about 12 inches under the ground as told him by the natives in the first instant. He discovered a skeleton of a white man quite perfect with the, the exception of one of the knee joints which was singed a little by fire. The body had been buried with the knee drawn up. This is a traditional Aboriginal burial. And as a fire had evidently swept over the grave, dug under the remains of an old Mayan Mayan. It is supposed this part of the skeleton had become singed as before described. Under the head, Mr. Allen found a few pieces of leather, supposed to be the remains of Mr. Jellyrand's trousers, and a piece of dark gambrel, which together with the skull he took home to his station, where they were seen by Mr. Hop, Mr. Bolden. The skull showed the, um, the absence of the front tooth exactly as before stated, and one of the two of the back teeth on each side of the jaw were wanting. The forehead is high and prominent. Mr. Allen, who speaks the native language well, also learned from the blacks that the white man, when fallen in with by the natives, gave them to understand his comrade Hess had died of fatigue about 20 miles uh, back up the river and that he had come through about 20 miles of thick scrub and ranges. The white man lived with the white tribe, with the tribe for about two months till one afternoon when sitting on the ground, mending his breeches, he was suddenly pounced upon from behind, pulled down on his back, and strangled by the blacks jumping on his neck. Uh, all right, so that's uh, is one that we got. And later, um, uh, a corroborating report says about three months uh, ago, John Allen accidentally fell into conversation with one of his uh, Bethendal tribe residing near his own station, this is Taru, which is just up the coast of Moonlight Head, who had married a gin from the Barrett country. From him he learned that he, this gin had been present at the murder of uh, Mr. Jellybrand. When suckling an infant, now about seven years old, and that she had seen the body of the second white man, Mr. Hess, up the river, about 15 miles distant, as before described, lying with his face uppermost, untouched by either dogs or birds of prey. Mr. Allen lost no time in finding out the black woman and from herself learned that at the time before stated a white man's jelly brand's cooey attracted their attention and caused them great alarm, never having heard anything of that kind before. After considerable difficulty and persuasion, her tribe were induced to go up to him when he made signs to show his urgent want of food and at the same time gave them to understand that another white man, Hess, was in extreme distress from the same cause further up the river. Having administered to his wants, a party proceeded in search of his comrade, but the proffered aid came too late. He was found dead. The tribe did all in their power to make Mr. Jellybrand comfortable, but as he refused to sleep in their mine mine, they built him one expressively of his own. He lived with his tribe on terms of perfect friendship for about two moons, two months, when their privacy was invaded by a large body of natives from uh, the river Panyork, distant about seven miles eastward of Cape Otway. 
The Pan York tribe did all in their power to persuade Mr. Jellybrand to rejoin them. But finding opposition not only from him but the Barrett people, the stronger party, in a fit of jealousy, sought an opportunity to murder Mr. Jellybrand. Accordingly, on one fine sunny afternoon, the Barrett tribe being out seeking food and Mr. Jellybrand at the camp alone, mending his trousers with kangaroo sinews, three of the Pan York men went and talked to Mr. Jellybrand. And thus taking him off his guard, one seized him from behind by the throat, while another put two fingers up his nostrils, the third jumping on his chest till life was extinct. The murderers then decamped, taking with them only the coat of their victim. When the Barrett tribe returned and found what had been done, they expressed great regret for the loss of their white companion and went into mourning after the known native fashion, painting themselves white and cutting their foreheads, etc., but did not attempt to retaliate on the Pan York tribe as they were too strong for them. They then buried the body and threw his pistols and gold watch into a creek adjoining the spot. And that's uh, the corroboration of uh, the first story. Um, now, uh, Hugh Gibson, who had a station close by to um, Jelly, uh, where Jellybrand's grave was, they knew of the Jellybrand grave, and uh, um, Henry Allen died shortly after that, but his um, brother, John Allen, proceeded along the coast of one of the two blacks, the remnant of the tribe that possessed the country, and was shown where Jellybrand was buried, and the tooth with the gold stopping was found. Now he also says the grave is about halfway between the river and the ocean and is marked on the government plans, but I do not think it is correctly located on them. I know the spot well, and it is used as a starting point to fix a boundary for my run. Now um, we've got some people from uh, Princeton, uh, which I'm glad to have here, and they will know which uh, property I'm talking about. I am not sure when this took place, but I fancy since uh, 1860. There was a very numerous tribe of blacks about there at one time, and near the spot where Jelly Brown was buried, there was a bed of human bones near the break of the cliff and skulls amongst them. Now that's uh, the owner of the Glen Apple Station. Now that was uh, written to the uh, Warrnambool Standard on the uh, 5th of September in 1888, and uh, C.S. Brown uh, writes two weeks later and says of that report, um, the real facts of the case um, are simply as follows. About the month of July 1841, the brothers Henry John and William Allen came to uh, uh, this area, and just quickly paraphrasing it, um, uh, the person was killed at the Jelly Brown River, and that caused him to take two of the Allendale black men as they went to the Jelly Brown. The grave was shown to him by the old Aboriginal named Pim, so we have a name for one of these Aboriginals, who supported Mr. Jelly Brown until he was killed by one of the Cape Otway tribes. Mr. Henry Allen took the skull and the buttons of the coat, which were in good state of preservation with him. He wrote to Mr. Thomas Jelly Brown, but got no reply, as the Jelly Brown family in Tasmania. It will be remembered that Mr. Latrobe went to Tasmania and acted as Lieutenant Governor uh, and, and accused Mr. Jelly Brown at once of courtesy towards Mr. Allen. The result was that early in February 1847, Mr. Jellybrand came over and in company with Mr. Allen, went to the grave. Mr. Allen and myself carefully dug up the bones. I was rather surprised to find the bones in such a good state of preservation, even the finger bones. He carefully packed them and Mr. Jellybrand took them with him. And that uh, is where um, I have got so far in my, my research. Um, now, the, uh, that is, uh, you know, the pursuit, really, of the Henry Allen story. Now, the way I'd like to substantiate that is uh, by uh, calling your attention to an amazing woman I found, a genealogist um, called Jenny Fawcett in uh, Warrnambool, and she has done uh, detailed biographies of the Allen family. There were eight of them, and what I'm basically looking for is their bona fides. Could their uh, story have been a total invention? My contention is, is no way that it could have been. And the amount of people that have corroborated the story. Also, in the Trobe's diary, he records on one of his visits to the uh, Cape Otway region that he camped the night near poor Jelly Brown's grave. Now, also, uh, Bob, Bob Butt and uh, Jack Loney uh, heard that um, Ada Gracie, who's with us this evening at the back, Really nice to see you here. I hope you're here for another six years because you will be a hundred in six years' time. 
Um, Ada Gracie was taken to Jelly Brown's grave uh, just after the First World War. So it was common knowledge in the Princetown region that Jelly Brown's grave was where it was. When Bob Butt got the uh, map, he uh, found Ada Gracie and uh, asked her about uh, Jelly Brown's grave. He knew where it was from the uh, coordinates and uh, Ada Gracie led him to the exact spot. Uh, <coughs> now, uh, thank you for that, Ada. Uh, <coughs> uh, because you know, that's a you know, critical one there. And I mean, that's the oral history too that's involved in this. Now, as far as that goes, um, my latest research shows that um, Thomas Jellybrand, the son of uh, Joseph Tice, crossed Bass Strait in, 18, um, in 1847. He crossed and he spent six, six weeks in uh, Victoria and then returned. My question is, what was he carrying with him and what did he do with it? Because there is no record of the burial of Joseph Tice Jellybrand's bones. So the mystery continues and I'm still tracking it. Um, now, with respect to uh, our theory, uh, I have uh, here um, a map of uh, his, and some of you won't be able to see it from the back, but basically uh, what we're saying is that uh, uh, here is Winchelsea where uh, the last conversation was held with, um, with Atkins, that uh, he basically followed the case the Barra River, camp the night at uh, Birragara, and uh, the question we're asking now is when would he have uh, wrestled with his ego and said, I'm lost? Because he'd already said to Hess, look, I know where I am, so at what point would he have said, I don't know which way I'm going? Because what he was trying to do was to go in this direction and then cut to the Ugangs and back to Melbourne. And this is a fascination of how the hell could he have been heading southwest when he should have been heading at least north or even northeast? And that's a question that uh, is hard to answer, and I've got my various theories. And I've spent two and a half hours on the phone with Bob that today, even discussing the psychology of what the guy was up to. Anyway, continues down to uh, very go. And I would have said that, and Hess would have said, look, I've given you another day, and we still haven't found these uh, the spatial. Uh, let's go back. But what we think happened is we got down to the, the uh, Durangamide, Durangamide Swamp area, and there we think that the horses bolted. And they bolted to Lake Colac, thus giving rise to the uh, theory of the disappearance of him on the, sh on the shores of Lake Colac. There were hoofprints there, and they did follow them, but we're saying they didn't have any riders on them. And that's the key. What they did is they headed down uh, through the Durangamid Swamp. They were on foot now. So we thought that what, what uh, we think is the case, that if you're on foot there, you had the choice of going back up here and going probably about 50 k's back this way, or being at this stage, and Jelly Ram would have known that the sea was possibly about uh, 20 k's in this direction, but he would never have known what he had to get through to get there. But our contention is that if that spot there, the horses had bolted, what did he do? So I suggest, like Englishmen do, is they follow rivers. That, you know, in Australia, it's a bit of a problem because you end up at uh, Lake Eyre, can't you? Which is a problem. But not in England, you can't do that. So he's an Englishman, he's lost in the bush. So he got down to a roundabout forest, and uh, there he uh, would have thought, I am totally lost. And he was in a gully. He, he lost the uh, Warrior Hill, seeing them about, about this area. So he was in thick scrub to the, the, the left and the right of him. But we believe that uh, the, uh, the way was clear. Uh, here on the side of the river, and I can uh, substantiate that later on as to why it was clear, not as it is today in some places. So, they continued down here and walked to here, and they got to Road Knight Creek, and Road Knight Creek uh, heads due south. So we believe that he went up the Road Knight Creek to gain elevation, hoping that perhaps here he could have got up there and seen where he was. So, you know, hoping he may have seen the sea or whatever. But when he got to the top of the Road Knight Creek, he then saw or heard another river, and that is now the Jelly Brown River. So they dropped in that side, probably Hess was going, look, I want to go, I want my mummy. Uh, so but he dragged him on, because he was that sort of character, and followed the Jelly Brown River on my track here, Carlisle River, and then headed south, because he knew that Henty's were over here in their uh, 
their area, they'd settled the area, so I believe that they took, at some stage, or he took the decision, I'd have a better chance of getting help down here, or getting food or whatever, so they continued. And they got down to here, to the, uh, the lower Jelly Brand, and uh, we're heading out to Princeton, where the uh, Jelly Brand's mouth is. All right, now, um, over here is uh, the, I'm just pointing to you kind of a closer look, but this is a view from the gravesite. Now, I believe that he came down through the Jelly Brand Valley here, and at that point, he is about three, two and a half k's from the sea. So he would have heard the sea. But not only that, he would, he's down in the valley and he would have seen the campsite here of the Aboriginals. And this campsite, believe me, is a really old campsite, uh, estimated by Lionel Herodine here, who got taken to the campsite, as at least 10,000 years old. The, it's an Aboriginal midden. You can't see it there. There's no mark or anything of it. You can walk right over and not know it's there. So, he would have seen that campsite there, staggered up through this <coughs> staggered up through this area here, and just said, look, I'm dying, help me. And the Aboriginals took him in and they helped him. There were only seven of them there, and I've read you the story about what happened then. And that's what I believe uh, actually um, happened to him. Um, and, you know, the, the rest of it is um, in the story that I've just read you. Uh, that basically is... Uh, um, the end of the story for Jellybrand, unfortunately. Um, but uh, it's, it's different from, I guess, the accepted ways that we're looking at things at the moment. Um, where I'm going now is obviously to find out uh, what happened to Thomas Jellybrand and uh, whether he was carrying a box and why between uh, gathering up the remains of his father and uh, getting to Port Ferry, which was then called Belfast, and then going back to Launceston, uh, I've got the microfilm of um, uh, the Launceston advertiser to look and see if there was any report of him coming back there and what state he was in and what he did and so on. That's uh, where my research is at the moment. Um, I think I would like to end just by saying that um, uh, there are so many different uh, twists and turns. It's almost like the road from the back road from Dean's Marsh to Jelly Brand that was on tonight. It reminded me of the twists and turns of the Jelly Brand story. There are many sort of issues that I think it raises. There are, you know, the historical uh, perspectives, the things like the values of myths and legends to our society, uh, the idea of the frontier, the alien environment, the savage, civilizing, exterminating natives, legitimacy of occupation, heroes and villains, the class and state systems of the time. Um, all of these things, I think, are, are enmeshed in this incredible story. And, uh, you know, I suppose, you know, for the rest of my life, I'm going to be um, on the trail of, of Joseph Tice. And really, um, I've even said to the family that my objectives really are to uh, afford Jelly Brown a rightful place in the history of the white settlement of Australia. I think he is totally unrecognised, just like his gravesite is. If I can prove this is his gravesite, the Kerrigan White Shire say they will foot the bill to protect the site. I've already got it registered under, um, or gazetted as an Aboriginal um, site. And if I can prove my theory, and Bob's theory, then I would like it registered as an Australian, uh, European side of settlement. Uh, so I'm saying that I hope this is the start of uh, the recognition of uh, Joseph Tice Jellybrand. And I, I hope that you go away from um, here thinking about the man and uh, his contribution to history. And um, that if you do hear of anything, if there's something out there, something in your attic, that uh, you um, might come across, because I've had so many people come up to me with various, uh, various uh, pieces of evidence, letters and so on. I know the evidence is out there, and I've just got to find it. And uh, so far, I've um, found all of this, and it's just you know, fascinating, absolutely fascinating. And I um, would like to end there, uh, and perhaps if there are uh, any questions you'd like to ask me, uh, not too difficult ones at the moment, like where are his bones, because I don't know that yet, but uh, coming in next year, I might have the answer. So that, ladies and gentlemen, is my research to this point, and I, I thank you for your attention. Now, um, do you have any, any questions or, or points that you'd like to make? Yes. Right, yes, uh, 
I don't have anything on this. Um, I've got uh, Jenny Fawcett has asked me to uh, get hold of his, um, of his last will and testament. And from that, we can then trace and find out more of the man because uh, my concentration is on Jelly Brand, and I think that I've got to say Hess was a, a big player in the whole of the story. And as far as um, his uh, bones go, all I've got is the record that the, the Aboriginals went to where he was, and he was in perfect state of preservation, and I know nothing uh, past that. So it raises the obvious question of uh, they knew where he was. Did they go back and bury him? Um, did they then not, uh, you know, in oral history record that? Is that information still there? I, I still have to find that. Yeah. What is Jelly Brand Yeah. Uh, uh, one of the things that was in the newspapers was, well, part of the lecture I was going to give, I was going to um, say how Jelly Brand got his name and when. <laughs> I, didn't actually, uh, I didn't actually say that. That was a misquote. But I thought, well, they've said it, so I better get on my bike and do some research. So I, I went through um, the local people here, uh, went through the place names of Victoria, uh, and got hold of a very helpful lady in Meldrum, and she, she searched the records, and uh, there is no record of Jelly Brand being uh, gazetted as a name. Um, it was formerly called um, Jelly Brand River, that was the original name of the settlement we're standing in, and in 19... 91, you had the centenary of the school here, so that would make 1891 when there was a school here. So my estimation is add 20 years to that, and that would probably be when uh, some settlement would have been here. That, that's where my research on that the one has got. But I was given that one, handed that hot potato uh, 10 days ago, so I quickly ran around and um, ran around. So that's just something that I'll find out, uh, because it, it, the, you know, the information is somewhere, but the official bureaucracy don't have that information. So I've been given the names of some old times around here. Uh, the guy that I nearly got to died two years ago, and all his papers have gone with him, uh, as far as I'm aware. So, you know, just even in the town we're sitting, you know, it's, you know, it's 106, you know, 50 years ago, and yet we, we don't know. And I mean, this is an amazing thing about the history of Australia, that how can this stuff be lost, you know, in such a short period of time? I don't know if that answers your question, but that's as far as I've got with it. But I can guarantee you that I'll find the answer. Yeah. David, uh, what time of the year did Jelly Brand head off on his ill fated journey? Yeah, right. Uh, February the 22nd, uh, 1837. Because uh, I thought maybe it might have been uh, in the winter when there was no sun and you came to Sorrento. Uh, where was the sun? Right, yep. We don't yep. know what the sun Yeah, yep. look, absolutely. Because the man, uh, it seems, should have been travelling north and then northeast, and he ended up travelling southwest and south. And uh, I've got a, the records I've got is that he, he took no compass. All the records I, I've got show that uh, he was just out for a day trip. He took two ships' biscuits with him, and uh, really he was just out for a day trip. Must have been a cloudy day. Yeah, right. But the point is, it wouldn't have been cloudy for the two or three days after that. So the question is. Uh, how, how long would it take him before he realised he was travelling south, for instance? And anybody, any, you know, even, you know, anybody can see where the sun rises and sets. So um, Bob and I have got the idea that um, he was convinced he was on the uh, Lee River, so he excluded everything else from his mind. He was going to get to that station no matter what. So I think he would ignore it whether he was going north, south, east or west. He was just convinced he was on that river and he was going to find the place. That's right, yeah, and I, I believe that he followed that river till all recognition of anything around him was gone and he was totally disorientated. It was the classic uh, case of, you know, lost in the bush. And, you know, the disorientation, and so Bob and I have been in the area and we just got convinced that he was just totally disorientated. But he, he was constantly, you know, he was, he was really you know, convinced of where he was going and what he was doing. And that drove him, and poor old Hess was dragged along with him, and uh, he uh, just became lost in the valley. So when he, when he got to Burragara, he was, you know, you know the golf courses and stuff like that, he couldn't see anything further than the walls of, you know, the two cliffs on either side of him. So, as Bob and I have said, that even in the morning, he probably wouldn't have seen the sunrise till about midday, and then seen it set, uh, you know, with, you know, mountain ash trees to the left and right of him. 
So I'm just trying to imagine how it must have been for the man uh, and uh, where it is in relation to North, South, East and West. And I, I'm just fascinated with the psychology of that man in that position and basically lost. And where did he, where did he basically get to when he said, I am lost? And when he did, what did he do then? Would you have been in that position? Would you have said, look, let's go back that way. We know that this river we've got here, let's go back that way. But my contention is that they have lost their horses and then they were in a pickle. To go 50 miles back that way or 20 miles south to the coast. Right? But yeah, the compass directions are amazing. Yeah. Just one of those two points of anchor, is it? Two points Accurate. of anchor. Yeah. Yes. Said the climb up there and we pinpointed that. Yes, uh, uh, last uh, two weeks ago I took my um, two year sevens and walked up, made Chuck uh, Brown. Um, they, they had a good time, but uh, I was you know, look, looking to see if I could see uh, uh, Cryo Bay from there. Uh, and the, the contention is that if they'd gone up that uh, hill, then uh, they would have seen uh, Cryo Bay and they'd have known exactly where they were, right? But, so, but they never did climb that. So um, Ackers and, uh, and um, Hedge basically said, well look, there's that hill there and that hill there, let's climb up one of those and we're right. And Jay Brown said, no, no, look, what are you talking about? I know where I am, you know? And I mean, if he'd climbed there, then they'd have been right. But he didn't. And I said, I don't know why he didn't. Other than he was uh, an arrogant so-called Bushman. How, how reliable is the record of the conversation? Right. Yes, right. Um, I, I would prefer to tear that up and forget about it because then it would make my theory even more uh, uh, less contentious. And the reason I'm saying that is, is because that is the reported conversation as uh, um, related to Lloyd who was at the station, the Pollock station. So he returned and that is a report of the conversation uh, that they had as reported to Lloyd, and Lloyd wrote that down. Now, um, I investigated Lloyd, and it says that he wasn't, uh, his veracity has been questioned. But, you know, that's a pretty long sort of, uh, you know, story again. Uh, and it could be a heap of rock. And I prefer if it, I prefer it if it was. Now, my, my problem with that is, um, Ackers, another reflection on it, is that, some people said to Agnes when he returned, how did you leave these two guys out in the bush? You know, what are you doing? And I mean, imagine you as a shepherd at that so time, a returning time. back there, and you've, you said, look, well, I've just come back, and uh, look, you know, they've gone. They, they just said, go home. And uh, another angle on it is that uh, they said to Agnes, uh, look, uh, if you want to go, go. Because Agnes, on another, uh, another bit I've got from him, knew that the, there, there were uh, warring blacks in that area. So he was only too ready to get out of there. You know, he said, I want to go out there, and you're going to a place, it's unknown. And I've heard there are, there are vicious, uh, you know, marauding um, Aborigines in that area. So he turns, he turns for home. So he takes a day to get back. And, and you imagine you're riding on the bus, and oh, what am I going to tell those guys when I get back? Uh, so I'm, I'm still, you know, a, a bit worried about, you know, his story. That is what he related when he got back, uh, and you know it could be a total fabrication. But he had to basically tell them something when he got back, so that's the story we've got. Do you know what I mean? Well, yeah. Although if it did take like, a day to get back, and presumably with a horse, it seems as if Hess and um, Charlie Brand's trek an extraordinary route. Yeah, yeah. Yes, it's right. It must have been weeks then. Well, this thing, see, this basically here is 140 kilometres. 140 kilometres. And about any experience and divisions, I mean, can you really be confident? Oh, look, the, the point is that, you know, my, my contention is that they, he did make it, he got down there and he was starving. Now, I, I believe that it took him, and uh, we worked it out, we reckon two and a half to three weeks is how long it took him. Now, the point is, you know, the guy that got lost in the Tasmanian bush, Compare it with him, right? We, we've got tales of how long people can survive. Two and a half weeks is not a long time in terms of survival. You can do it. Now, the point is, I've got to you know, come to terms with a guy who had a weak chest, but the point is that on his other expedition in the, port, in the Western Port area, 
he, 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 he sort of claps over a tree and he had heart palpitations and stuff like that, but that was a really rugged trip. But he, he fought against it and he got through, you know? And so I'm convinced that he could have made it. You know, he, wasn't, he, he probably wasn't as fit as I am now or you are now, but uh, I think he could, have, he could have made it. And following the river, and at that time, Bob and I think that it was far more clear. It was like a wooded area. It wasn't uh, overgrown as it is now, um, because we've got a theory too. You see, the fox wasn't introduced at that time, and uh, the animals then would have kept the banks of the river clear. When the fox was introduced, it wiped out a lot of the animals and stuff around, so then uh, tea tree and all that sort of stuff grew up, and it's become far more overgrown now. If you go down now, it's a bit harder to get through. Then, I believe it was much clearer than it is now, and they could have walked quite well through open wooded country. And followed the, um, the byron down, and then the only rough bit they've got is up um, the road my creek, dropped to the other side. But then the jelly ground is, you know, wide and open, and he probably would have and says, Look, oh, great, you know, now we can make it and drag your heads down to um, the coast. That's what I would have happened. Yep. Uh, the uh, confession was obviously believed by the authorities. What do you, what's your theory on that? The confession that Mike Pollack. About the, uh, the murders of the two white guys. Right, yeah. Um, all right, my, my, my idea with that is that uh, Tanafi, it said the guy had his uh, confession forced out of him. And even in the literature at the time, they said that, uh, you know, the whole thing with the whites and their communication with the blacks is that they would often go up to black people and, and, and if they wanted to get anything out of it, they could get anything out of it because the blacks would say, look, we will tell them whatever they want. You know, that was the idea. That was the way the blacks basically uh, uh, confronted the whites. If pressure was put on them, they'd tell them whatever they wanted. And there was so, much, so many records of, you know, what's that over there? And uh, is it this? Yeah, yeah, it's that. You know, whatever it is. You know, or a kangaroo or something like, uh, you know, I don't know what it is over there. So that becomes the name of the kangaroo and so on. So I think the confession was forced out of the, out of the black um, the chief and he, he was killed. But even at the time of the records, it says that uh, uh, they were really worried about whether that was uh, uh, the, the facts of the situation and it was a forced confession. But it was an easy closure of the whole thing. Once it had been done, it's, it was then easy to say, right, the matter's over, there's closure on it. And uh, that suited everyone. So that was the, uh, the myth, I believe, that was promulgated and it's still in, heavily in Colac. If people do know about Jerry Bretzel, I just feel on the shores of Lake Colac. My contention, I, 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 what I would say is I don't think that's correct because we've got a grave, we've got descriptions here. The Colac story has got no um, uh, bones, it's got no. Um, stories, because if Marion stuff settled there three months later, how come he didn't go out with the blacks and ask them what had happened? Why isn't there any record of that? I can't believe that Mary settled there three months after Jody Brown's disappearance and wouldn't have gone out there and said, well, you know, what happened? You're, you're in this, right? Tell me what happened. No record of it. Now, does that mean they didn't bother asking the questions? Or they did ask and the Aboriginals knew nothing more about it. And I believe the second is, is, is the truth. Because there's nothing there. There's no, you know, they stripped the clothes off the, uh, off the, uh, the guys. Why was nothing of that found? Why wasn't the watch he was carrying found? Why wasn't the flip off pistols found? All that we've got is uh, survivors and stuff were found at Mount Grace. Now I believe that story is probably correct. We've got to research that. But that doesn't alter what I think because they had no rights on those horses. And that's why I